Good morning. The, I've been looking forward to teaching these couple of chapters we have in front of us this morning for a couple of weeks. I'm excited to be here to open God's Word with you. Um, but let me begin and introduce you to the subject by, by saying this. The nation of Israel is a mystery of the highest magnitude. And in the eyes of the world, the Jewish people have been the subject of the most incredible history Uh, Even today, I'm sure as we wake up and we read the news or we watch the news, uh, Israel remains at the center of attention with the ongoing war in the Middle East. But while the world doesn't give much attention to the Bible, the connection between Israel and God's word is still relatively widely known, and I believe it still lingers as an awkward and unanswered question in the back of many people's minds. People just can't quite work out what is going on with the nation of Israel. But there's an awkward question in the mind of, minds of many Christians too, and on the 14th of May, 1948, after the Second World War, a door was opened for the people of Israel to begin returning to their land. And with that incredible event in view, uh, John Stott was a, a well-known Bible teacher, and he was famously asked this question, what is the significance of the nation of Israel in our day biblically, and he answered by saying it has no significance at all. And so according to his theology and the, many, and the theology of many others, Israel today has no biblical significance. There's some kind of relic of the past or a, perhaps a type that's been fulfilled in the church. But there are other Christians as well who believe that the nation of Israel will still yet play a significant role in God's redemptive purposes. And so both inside and outside the church, the nation of Israel is a mystery of the highest magnitude. And so if you can take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to our passage of Scripture, Uh, today we're looking at Isaiah chapter 28 and 29 and the My sermon is titled, The Mystery of Israel Unfolded, because that's the subject of the chapters in front of us. And so if you want to know what is is God doing with Israel, even what is God doing with the nation of Israel today, then you really need to understand these two, what are really are neglected chapters of Scripture. And just to give you a summary Right at the beginning, these are two chapters that identify and unfold the mysterious way in which God is dealing with Israel and by which we can also observe how God often deals with ourselves. Uh, To give you an outline as uh, as we come to the end of the 28th chapter and work our way down there, uh, firstly we'll see the mystery identified and then as we work through the 29th chapter we'll see the mystery unfolded and explained in more detail. Just to quickly remind you of the the major theme, in in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, they're really asking one question, and they're asking, where is security to be found? What is the foundation upon which you're building your life? And we're all building our lives ultimately grounded on something. Uh, To remind you of the uh, the context, you remember Assyria was that, that massive amalgamation of Gentile nations and their God's rod of judgment uh, in the world at that time. And as Assyria sweeps through the known world, taking over all of these different areas, uh, you need to have in mind that it's, it's not just a nasty army that's terrifying the people. This is God's judgment that is sweeping through the world. Do you understand that? And so it's God's judgment. This is a, a, a time of great tribulation. It's a time of worldwide judgment. And, and that picture should trigger us to think of, do you remember there's a yet future tribulation and a yet future day of the Lord, a yet future worldwide judgment still to come? And I hope as soon as I say that, suddenly this text becomes immediately relevant for us because that day is still ahead for us as their day is still ahead in their time. But given this Assyrian threat, Israel, Judah, and all the surrounding nations, they're thrown into this state of panic and terror. And there's one great temptation for for God's people. That's to either go down uh, to Egypt to trust in the power of their horses and chariots. You know that famous concept, uh, to trust in Egypt, and and that's in hope of defending against the Assyrians, or 
by faith alone to trust in the Lord. That's Isaiah's message to the people, and that's the, the context that we find ourselves in, and they just have this very straightforward decision to make. What will be the foundation as this approaching storm comes? Will they trust the Lord or look for human strength in, in the form of Egypt? But if you can look with me at our first verse, this is Isaiah 28 verse 1, and it's, it's the section known as the book of woes, and so it it begins with a woe. It says, woe, that's a curse, a, a pronunciation of judgment. Woe to the proud, uh, you could sum it up as, but woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty. And so Ephraim refers to the, the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes in Israel. They were uh, marked out as being proud. They thought little of God. They lived in luxury and ease. And as one commentator said, they were thoroughly enslaved by wine. It's not actually much different from our own culture in the day in which we live. And so you can understand the general reason for this woe, the general condition of the people. And and this picture here of a fading flower, it alludes to their demise. This is is dropping off everything that is currently beautiful in in the world around them. In verse 2, the woes continued, and it says, Behold, the Lord has a strong and mighty agent. And this is referring to Assyria, this powerful, mighty agent at the disposal of God. It's described as a storm, a storm of hail and a tempest of destruction, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters, like a great flood that will sweep through. And it says this, he has, that's God, he has cast it down to the earth with his hand. And that should remind us of the book of Revelation. Do you remember the judgments at the end? And all those catastrophic judgments are thrown down onto the earth. And so verse 3 says, The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim is trodden underfoot. That's the word of woe. And the fading flower, it says, will be like the first ripe fig. You imagine this one first piece of fruit on the tree prior to summer, which one sees... And as soon as it's in his hand, he just swallows it up. That's what the ten northern tribes will be. So Assyria will soon strike Israel like a storm. And like a fig, they'll they'll suddenly, the destruction will come and they will just swallow them up as as this word of woe that we're introduced you. Sorry, introduced with. But the chapter... It's not only about judgment. And this really surprised me as I studied it. So this, this chapter doesn't only speak of judgment. It's got a heavily chiastic structure, which is a Hebrew method of communicating. It has pairs of parallel thoughts, and they build on each other, and they come to a single point of emphasis in, emphasis in the middle, and that's how this chapter is. So the, at one side, we have this word of judgment and a woe, um, but if you look at the last verse, this is verse 29 of chapter 28, right towards the end of the chapter, And it says, this also comes from the Lord. So not just a woe, but something else. And it speaks of God's wonderful counsel. The words there, it says, he has made his counsel wonderful. So there's a pair of opposing thoughts in this chapter. We have a, a woe on the one hand and a wonderful counsel at the end. That's, the, I guess, the bookends of, of this chapter. Uh, in verse 5, we're, we're told that in spite of this coming storm, this judgment's going to come, but we're also told that there will be a remnant. Uh, verse 5, in that day, the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful crown and a glorious diadem, it says, to the remnant of his people, a spirit of justice for him who sits in judgment. And you have to imagine uh, we've looked ahead previously at that Assyrian siege, but you have to imagine that, that picture because it says here, he will become a strength to those who repel the onslaught at the gate. And you remember what happened there uh, and their incredible deliverance. And, and, it, and it, so it gives this hint of hope to this believing remnant. But again, the matching thought, if you look at uh, the end of verse 22, it speaks of decisive destruction in all the earth. And so on the one hand, we have a woe, we have a wonderful counsel, and then we have this remnant and we have this decisive destruction. And you can see these thoughts uh, starting to pile up. In verse 7 and 8, uh, we have this description of the, the drunken priests and prophets. And this is the leaders in Israel. These were the ones that were steering the ship 
we could say, and, and they're described as being full of filthy vomit without a single clean place. It was just an utter picture of a drunken mess. Uh, and rising up from this filthy people comes this horrible question, and it's, it's directed to the prophet Isaiah. And you have to have in mind here that this is so much like what Isaiah is going through, is so much like what Jesus went through. You remember all the accusations and the questions and the leaders were just hovering around trying to ensnare him and trap him. The same thing's happening here with Isaiah verse 9. This is the, these drunken leaders of Israel. They're saying, to whom would he, to whom would Isaiah teach knowledge? And to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk? And so they, they feel like the prophet is speaking to them as if they're just little children, little babies. They don't need to be taught these, these things from Isaiah. And so Delich, one commentator, he says they sneer at the prophet, that intolerable moralist who was just upholding God's values in their society, and they just sneer at him. Verse 10 says, For he says, precept, and these are, these are famous words, I'm sure you remember this, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. But if you could understand how that's being spoken, the tone in which it's being said, uh, the, the, in Hebrew, the repetition of all these little small words, it, it gives the impression of this babbling language, just mocking the teaching of the prophet, just this babbling. It doesn't even make sense to them. Uh, of this. So it's these, this babbling noise coming up from these drunken, sneering uh, scoffers. In verse 11, God turns the whole picture around on them, and it says, Indeed, this is from God, indeed, He will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. And so as they were speaking to, to God's prophet, God would turn around and speak to them in the same way. And I, I do wish I could say more here, but I'll just give you a general outline. The point is that this prophecy doesn't just have the Assyrian invasion in view. And so, yes, you could, you could think that these foreign people, all these Assyrians will come, they will come in judgment, they will be speaking a different language, and they, they will hear that babbling tongue as a, a judgment from God upon them. But there's also an incredible parallel with what we see in the New Testament. And so you need to think ahead. Do you remember the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came? We all know that. Uh, in the day of Pentecost... Uh, in that day, the apostles spoke in what was perceived by the Jews as babbling tongues. Do you remember that? They spoke in babbling tongues. And do you remember that they also thought that the apostles and those speaking in, in tongues were drunk? Do you remember that detail? And so do you see how this picture has just been entirely reversed? And so that's the connection. The, the phenomena of languages or tongues was actually a sign of this judgment coming upon the people in Jesus' day. What Isaiah is speaking here came to a fulfillment at the day of Pentecost. And so they, in that day, they had rejected the teaching of Jesus and just like they had in this scene rejected the teaching of Isaiah. And so I won't go into the detail, but I'll just note 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20 and 21. If anyone wants to look there, it says that, that the speaking in tongues was not a sign for believers, but for unbelievers. And it's deeply connected with what is going on in this, this passage here. And so there's so many superficial understandings of what, of what you know, languages and the gift of tongues was, and it's, it's deeply connected to, to this context biblically. But to sum up the section, we can say that they rejected Isaiah's teaching. So all these, these people in Israel, they rejected Isaiah's teaching. And if you look at verse 16, the, the corresponding thought at this level is that they rejected the cornerstone. And this is one of the most foundational passages in, in all of Scripture to explain what's happening. They rejected the cornerstone. Verse 16 says, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion, that's in Jerusalem, a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone, and it's for the foundation. And, and I don't think I need to tell you, but in 1 Peter 2 verse 6, 
this verse is quoted, and we know that this cornerstone refers to Jesus. In the Old Testament, it was just generally the God of Jerusalem. In the New Testament specifically, this is referring to Jesus. And so we have this incredible parallel. The people in Isaiah's day uh, are presented with this cornerstone. The people in Jesus' day were the same. But so far, I've just given you this general shape of this chiastic structure. And, and as we get to the as we get to the center and the main emphasis of the chapter, I need to be more precise because there's not just one, but there's kind of two points. It's like a double chiasm. And if, and if I'm reading it rightly, it's almost as if it's a double emphasis. It's making a, a double point here. Um, and so it's something really important, and it really does focus in on the, the message Isaiah is communicating to the people. You can see it in verse 12. If you look there, it says, this is the, the first emphasis. And so it's right in the middle, and there's, this is the first one of two emphasis. And so in this first one, we, this is the, the proclamation of what we could call good news. They're in a terrible situation. They have this incredible tribulation that they're facing. And this is a message of good news that Isaiah brings. And verse 12 at the beginning is the very tip of this point, And it says, here is rest Give rest to the weary. And it's a message of hope in their hopeless situation that Isaiah is bringing to them. And if you could see, if I could draw it on a whiteboard, that's the very tip. And just behind it, there's these two thoughts that lead to it. On the one side, it says, with stammering lips, he will speak to this people. And on the other side, it says, yet they would not hear. God will speak, they will not hear. And the tip is, here is rest. That's the message. Give rest to the weary, this, this good news. And now the, the second point that goes right with that is in uh, verse 16. At the end of verse 16, the second e emphasis, and this describes the way of faith. And so it says, uh, again, there's, there's two foundations and there's this emphasis right in the, in the tip of it. The one, on the one side it says, I lay in Zion a foundation stone, and it's this building metaphor God's building something, a building, a foundation, and something's going to be laid on it. On the other side of the point of emphasis, it says, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. These are the tools that are used. So it's this building metaphor of a building, a foundation that's going to be laid on justice and righteousness. And the tip of this point in the linguistic structure, it says, he who believes in it will not be disturbed. That's the, the tip. So you have this good news, and he who believes it will not be disturbed. And that's the message that Isaiah is bringing to the people. Uh, and so it's this building metaphor. It's a building that won't fall down in the coming storm of the Assyrian crisis. And so this really is the sum and substance of the whole book of Isaiah. Uh, you remember the major theme was that question, where is security to be found? What's the foundation upon which we can build our life? The context is that Assyrian invasion, that's the judgment of God that will soon crash like a storm against Jerusalem. And with these two emphasized points, it's as if the, the whole book comes to this moment of clarity and Isaiah's instructing them to, to trust in the Lord by faith alone. And he promises that if they build this, their life on this foundation, on that basis, their life, they will not be disturbed in the coming storm that's, that's approaching. So, and I trust as we see that, it's like the gospel dressed in an Old Testament picture. As we come to the New Testament, isn't it the, the same message of faith alone in the cornerstone that we know is the person and work of Jesus Christ, who's to be the very foundation of our life, the very basis that we build everything in our life upon. And when we face the inevitable storm of God's judgment, everyone who trusts in him, Isaiah often says, will not be put to shame. And so that, is, that really is a moment of clarity with all the crazy pictures that are going on. The gospel is made so clear uh, to the people in Isaiah's day. And so um, and I think as that, that message, it, it really comes to us in exactly the same form. I don't believe I need to restate that. You know exactly what I'm saying. And it's this, the cornerstone is that, 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 
litmus test of your life. You either believe in it, you either trust in the Lord as the foundation of your life, or you don't and you're shattered and you're broken on it. There's no middle ground. Your life is either based on this or it's not. And so this is the the most intense point of clarity that Isaiah is coming to and it becomes as it's a simple test for them which side are they going to fall on and it's a simple point of clarity and a test in our own lives do we believe in Jesus as the foundation of our our life then the next thing we see so this incredible message is coming to the people of Israel and and when Isaiah gave this message of faith and this this good news You can look at the end of verse 12, it says their response, and it says, but they would not listen. That that, that message came, the way of salvation came, but they would not listen. And so when Isaiah pleaded with them to trust in this cornerstone, verse 15 says they made a covenant with death. And they wouldn't say, oh, we've made a covenant with death. They thought they'd trusted in something really strong. They had a better philosophy in their life. But from God's point of view, they had signed, as it were, their death warrant, made a covenant with death, and it means that they had trusted in Egypt. Um, That is where their hearts were. That is what they'd actually done. And that was as good as making a covenant with death. And so they rejected the message of faith. Uh, They rejected the cornerstone. And so you can think of this main emphasis, the, 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 the tip of this structure in this chapter In this sense, on the one hand, they mocked the message of faith and they placed their faith in a mockery. That's that's the emphasized point of of this 28th chapter. And that same message was repeated in Jesus' day and that same message was rejected in Jesus' day. And this is no small event that we're uh, understanding and comprehending this morning. This is a monumental rejection in the life of Israel, to reject the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is, there is something very central to how this passage plays out in redemptive history. And so the, the second half of this 28th chapter, it starts to come back down the, the other side of this, this emphasized point. In verse 15, it says they believed that Assyria, that overwhelming scourge that would come, they believed that it would not reach them. But in verse 18, they are told, when the overwhelming scourge passes through, so it will reach them, then you will become its trampling place. In verse 15, they they had made falsehood their refuge, and they had concealed themselves with deception. They weren't exactly forthcoming with Isaiah about what their plans were to make this alliance, and they were hiding it. They were living in a world of lies. They weren't being honest about what they were doing. But in verse 18, they are told of this coming storm, And it says, hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the secret place. And and their whole scheme to get around this will be exposed and washed away. And we really have to understand this image of the storm, that Assyrian threat as described as a storm. Because do you remember Jesus, perhaps his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount? Do we all remember that? In Matthew 5 to 7? And you remember how he finished that sermon by challenging his listeners to, to believe or to choose between two foundations. And, and it was, he used a building metaphor. And this comes exactly from what we're studying because Jesus said the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. Does that sound familiar? And it says it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. And so Jesus wasn't just making up messages. It's as if he, he was intimately acquainted. You remember when he was a, like a young boy and the, the religious leaders marveled at his teaching. He understood the scriptures. He understood these chapters that we're studying today. He was giving the same message and telling them so clearly what was going on. And so Jesus' message is a parallel of Isaiah's. He was saying the exact same thing, giving the exact same message to the, to the Jewish people in his day. But in Isaiah's day, just as the majority, so there was that remnant, as I mentioned, but the majority chose the wrong foundation, and the consequence was that a terrifying judgment fell on them. In the New Testament, the same thing happened. The majority rejected Jesus, 
and a corresponding terrifying judgment fell upon the Jews at that time as well. In verse 19, it describes the judgment. It says, As often it passes through, it will seize you from morning after morning. It will pass through any time, just suddenly, any time during the day or night. And it says these words, And it will be a sheer terror to understand what it means. And so this is no ordinary judgment that takes place. It will be a sheer terror to understand it. Uh, At the end of verse 21, it's described in these words, it's described as God's task, his unusual task, and his work. And these are superlatives, his extraordinary work. There's something about this judgment on the nation of Israel that is, is just extraordinary. God is doing something significant here as this rejection comes. And so this, this judgment has this element of mystery to it. And so if you remember, we had a, a woe at the beginning of the chapter, and I said we had a wonderful counsel at the end. Well, we, we come to the end of the chapter, and now we're seeing this, this extraordinary, extraordinary work of God, this wonderful counsel that will come from God's wisdom. And it, it speaks of how God will deal with Israel and Judah, and it does so, guess what, in the form of a parable. Does that sound familiar to you? How Jesus spoke in parables, and, it, and it's exactly the same as Jesus did with the religious leaders in his day. And Jesus intentionally hid truth from these people that rejected the message. He hid truth in the form of parables, and he explained it only to his disciples. Uh, you can see that. I won't show you there, but that's Mark 4, verse 11 and 12, if you'd like to look at that. But the parable here at the end of the chapter, it relates to a farmer And I won't read it, I'll just tell you really succinctly what it means. But first of all, it it talks about this farmer, he rips up and plows through all the rough ground, that's the first thing he does, and that's done before the careful sowing of the seed, they line it up and they lay out this, this seed in the garden, and that's all done before a crop of fruit or crop or fruit can be harvested. There's this sequence, this agricultural sequence to to the farmer's work. And so that's the parable. And that's the parable of how God will deal with Israel. And we aren't told the answer, but you can see it if you look at verse 28. Because it becomes apparent and it says, speaking of that first part of preparing the ground, that ripping up, that plowing, that harrowing aspect... It says he does not continue to thresh it forever. So that's part of the work, but he doesn't do that forever. And so that's the, this is the, the mystery, is that God's judgment and exile of his people, this is the meaning, is only temporary. And so Delich, the, the Hebrew commentator, says, The wise, divinely inspired course adopted by the farmer in the treatment of the field is a type of the wise course adopted by the divine teacher himself in the treatment of his nation. He says, God punishes, but it is in order that he may be able to bless. And so that's what's happening. We can conclude this 28th chapter by saying God's plowing punishment is only the first part of his work in the lives of his people. It's a necessary work, but it's not all his work. And, and this treatment won't last forever. So we come to the end of the 28th chapter with this incredible mystery how God's dealing with his people, but it won't last forever, this, this punishment. Uh, in the New Testament, you'll be familiar as well with Romans 9 to 11, that famous section uh, where Paul comes to the same conclusion because I believe he understands these two chapters we have in front of us. And that's about how God is treating Israel in his day. And he concludes that their rejection is only temporary. He looked at this. He knew. He understood. He can see what God was doing because God's word gave him the same interpretation. And if you remember, he finishes that famous section at the end of chapter 11. But do you remember? He praises God and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And if you look at Uh, chapter 28, verse 29 of our passage, Isaiah says the same thing. This is where Paul, I believe, got it from. It says, this also comes from the Lord, this this marvelous way in which God will deal with his people. It says, who has made his counsel wonderful and his wisdom great. And so Isaiah is praising God for this incredible, mysterious way in which God will deal with his people. 
And so I said we would, as we work our way to the end of the 28th chapter, we see the mystery identified. And that mystery is the superlatively wonderful way in which God will deal with his chosen nation. That's the mystery. That's what this 28th chapter, that's the point it brings us to. And now as we turn to the the 29th chapter, uh, we see that this mystery is unfolded and we're given more detail about how God will do that. So it focuses in on this mystery and it, and it explains it in a lot more detail. The, the first two verses here in the 29th chapter, they summarize the whole chapter by giving us an, another woe, and, it, and we see as well there'll be a corresponding blessing. So it's a similar structure. Israel will be brought low, but we know now that it won't last forever. And at the end of the chapter, they'll be brought high again. That's the, that's the general big picture of this 29th chapter. In verse 1, it says, Woe, O Ariel. And, and that is a, another title for Jerusalem. So, a woe to Jerusalem. Verse 2, I will bring distress to Ariel, and she will be a city of lamenting and mourning. But then we see this corresponding blessing that will follow afterwards, and it says, and she will be like an Ariel to me. That's, that's a word of blessing. So there's going to be a curse, and then Jerusalem will be this Ariel. And the word I learned, it, it speaks of a, a, a hearth, you know, like a fireplace. This is where the burnt offerings, a flat stone where the fire of the offerings was, was placed. And so Assyria, as we know in the, in the future, they'll soon surround Jerusalem, And it pictures them meeting their destruction as if you imagine all these nations, all these people surrounding them, and Jerusalem is this altar of fire, and all the people are like wood just stacked up on it, and they just burn. That's the the picture of this Ariel, the meaning there. Uh, And so that's that's the blessing, that Jerusalem will be like that. Uh, Verse 3, it explains the, the woe aspect. And and this is interesting as well because it says I. This is he doesn't say Assyria will come up against you. It says I, meaning God, will camp against you, encircling you, and I will set siege works against you, and I will raise up battle towers against you. Then you will be brought low. That's what God's work is in the life of His people. And so this plowing judgment from God is coming, and through this, their pride will be finally and decisively broken. You remember the first chapter, it was woe to the proud in Ephraim, and their pride is broken. And I think, I, I'm very confident that this is where, you, maybe you've heard the Puritans talking about being humbled to the dust. Jonathan Edwards would speak about them, that oh, that people would be humbled to the dust. And we see that in verse 4, it says, from the earth you will speak, and from the dust where you are prostrate, where you are lying down in the dust, your words will come and your speech will whisper from the dust. And so this is a a prayer of genuine repentance from a posture of genuine humility that will fall on the nation. In verses 5 to 8, the the blessing that follows their repentance is described. Verse 5 says, The multitude of your enemies will become like fine dust. They'll just disappear. And their enemies are instantly blown away. God will just deal with it in an instant. Uh, Verse 6 and 7, the storm of judgment will slam against them. And it's described as the multitude of the nations that surround Jerusalem. Verse 8, it describes the these enemies, if we read that, it's this just description of them dreaming of taking over and capturing Jerusalem. But when they wake up, the dream becomes only a delusion. They were deluded to think that they could take Jerusalem. And so that's the broad outline for, for Israel's history. They will be cursed. They will be judged for not trusting in the cornerstone. But that won't last forever. And when they come to repentance that we've just seen described... God will turn and he will bless them. That's the the general course that the the chapter takes. And then there's a middle section here. It's verses 9 to 21. And it has another one of those chiastic structures, uh, those parallel thoughts that come to a point of emphasis. Uh, And and this one's fascinating because here, this is where we see this mystery aspect of God's judgment unfolded. And so first, the first step in this, this structure is, Uh, that we notice that there is a spiritually illiterate people, spiritually blind people. 
If you look at verse 9, it says, Stop and stare. This is Isaiah talking to the people in his day. Stop and stare. Blind yourselves and be blind. They become drunk, but not with wine. A different kind of uh, stupefaction, one commentator said. They're drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. He has shut your eyes, the prophets, and he has covered your heads, the seers. And as the Jews of Isaiah's day rejected the Lord as their cornerstone, they became spiritually blind, spiritually illiterate. Um, And so this is a judicial hardening, a punishment from God for their rejection. And, And their leaders are here described as the blind leading the blind. And again, does that sound familiar to you? And, and I think you'll say, yes, we, we see that in the New Testament. Uh, in Matthew 13, verse 14, Jesus says of the, those religious leaders in his day, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. And so what's spoken here is fulfilled in Jesus' day, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. And this prophecy, again, it isn't speaking just of the Assyrian invasion. It's telling us of what God is doing with Israel in Jesus' day. And because of this, we are starting to see what God is doing with Israel in our own day. We live in that same age, post-Christ, post-everything he did. As they reject him then, that moves into our stage of history, this age in which we live. And we can see what God is doing with the nation uh, now. And so this, this rejection that Israel has of Jesus, of the cornerstone, uh, is so significant. You know, sometimes people will say, oh, something's mentioned two times in the Gospels, or three times means it's, wow, that's a really important aspect of Christ's life. This one is mentioned, four, all four Gospels mention the Jews' rejection. It's the exclamation mark at the end of the book of Acts, this rejection of the Jewish people. And Paul takes three chapters in Romans 9 to 11 to explain it to us. And this is a really significant interpretive uh, event that is taking place, and it's rooted in these two chapters. And, but to bring you back, then the next step in, the, in this chiastic structure, so we had this spiritual illiteracy of the people, the next thing that happens is we see formal exterior religion. And you can see that in verse 13. And we're told that they're spiritually illiterate because, this is the cause, because of this thing that they did. And it says, because this people draw near with their words, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their reverence for me consists in traditions learned by rote. This is just formal exterior religion. This is going to church, professing faith in Christ, but having no actual change in your life. They, they, they had this superficial, shallow level of religion, but their hearts weren't truly changed. Because of that condition uh, was why they became spiritually blind. Again, this one is quoted Matthew 15, verse 7 to 8. And it, again, Jesus applies the judgment to those in, the Jews in his day. And he says simply, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. It's just, it's just speaking of this time of Christ. And the next step, spiritually illiterate. Uh, and then I can't remember our next one, formal exterior religion. The, the next step up. Uh, It brings us to really the main emphasis in this chapter, and I've titled it The Great Mystery, because it describes this marvelously wonderful plan. You know, what we finished with at the end of the the 28th chapter, what God will do with the nation of Israel. Verse 14, this is what God will do. It says, Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous. Do you see how it ties into the end of the 28th? This great mystery. God says the wisdom of their wise men will perish. And so God will hide his plan from them because in verse 15 it says they hide their plans from the Lord. And God just turns it around on them. Verse 16 makes the point by saying simply this, you turn things around. It's the the verse there about the pot uh, saying to the one who formed it. You know, that's that's the context there. And so... 
because they turn things around, God will turn things around. And at the very apex of this chapter, the very point of emphasis, we have this great mystery of what God will do to them. And we have this concept of a great reversal, a great turning around of, of what God will do. And quite simply, the great mystery is that there will be a great reversal. If you look at verse 17, this is a picture of it. Verse 17 just, is just amazing. It says, Is it not yet just a little while before Lebanon will be turned into a fertile field, and a fertile field will be considered as a forest? Do you see how it just turns it around? Lebanon was known for its trees, for its cedars, and the picture here is that Israel is the Lord's vineyard. That was cultivated farmland, good soil. Lebanon was trees and overgrown. It was the opposite. But the the, the picture here is that Israel, the Lord's vineyard, would be soon covered and overgrown with trees and bushes, and Lebanon would become a fruitful vineyard. Does that make sense? It's just a picture of God turning it around. But what's, what's a fascinating detail is that Lebanon was a Gentile land. And so this is saying that God will turn away from the Jews, and he will turn to the Gentiles. And so if you turn with me to Matthew the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verse uh, 42. Matthew 21, verse 42. This, is, this just fascinates me. Jesus, he's just told the parable of the wicked tenants to the vineyard. And I trust you can remember that. Vineyard imagery is so... Icianic. It's so much in the character of Isaiah. And so again, this, these themes are coming out. Jesus says to the Pharisees, did you never read the scriptures? You remember the, the vineyard sent workers in there and they kept killing them, rejecting them. Finally, he sends his own son and they killed and rejected him in this vineyard. But at the end of it, Jesus said, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone and it is marvelous in our eyes. And therefore, so listen to the great reversal taking place. Therefore, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. Do you see that God is in time and space? That is the great reversal that Jesus is speaking to those people. The kingdom will be taken from them and given to another people producing the fruit of it. And so God turns away from Israel and he turns his primary attention to the, the Gentiles. And this is God's mysterious way of dealing with Israel. If you'd turn with me as well to Acts chapter 28, verse 25. And just to reinforce this, this is the end of the book of Acts. So the gospel's gone out and they would preach to the Jews first, then the Gentiles. And at the end of it, there's all these... Uh, Jewish leaders, and Paul's engaged with them, teaching from morning till night, all the way through, reasoning with them from the Scriptures. And verse 25 says, this is Acts 28, verse 25, and when they did not agree with one another, the leaders weren't, weren't settled on what Paul was saying, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word, and this is his word, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, saying, the same verse, go to these people and say, you'll keep on hearing, but will not understand. And if you jump down to verse 28, this is the parting word. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And so at the end of the book of Acts as well, Jesus had it in his ministry. There is this great reversal. It's an act of judgment where God will turn from dealing with them and deal with the Jewish, uh, with the Gentile people. If you look back, uh, Isaiah 29 verse 18, back in our chapter, we see the, the structure comes down again from that high point. Just as there was a formal exterior religion with the Jews, now there is a, a true interior religion with the Gentiles. Verse 18, it says, On that day the deaf will hear the words of a book. Uh, out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. And, and in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 15, it says, This was to fill, again, what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, 
uh, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the what? Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles. And it says, upon them a light has dawned. A mega foss, a great light has dawned on the Gentiles. And so the Gospel of Matthew, uh, some call it the great dispensational gospel because these concepts are explained so clearly on those people a great light has dawned and so just as there was a a spiritually illiterate people there's now a spiritually literate people Uh, verse 19 says that these gentiles will rejoice in the holy one of israel And the New Testament, I've mentioned this before, applies that term of God specifically to the person of Jesus. And so the Gentiles here, the prophecy is that they will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, We were told at the beginning of the chapter that Israel would be brought low, that this judgment would come upon them before being brought high. And we haven't seen that yet. We've seen the Gentiles come to faith. Uh, But this is just as Paul argues, you know, when he says, after the fullness of the Gentiles are come in, then all of Israel will be saved. That's the high point that that will come as well. So if you look at verse 22, this is coming to the end of the 29th chapter. It says, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning, it's not the Gentiles anymore, it says concerning the house of Jacob. And Jacob was obviously the father of the 12 tribes. So when it's saying Jacob, it's comprehending all of Israel in him. So it's, it's, so Jacob or all Israel shall now, it says, not be ashamed, nor shall his face turn pale, nor shall they not be terrified of that judgment anymore. And so their fortunes here turn and God's terrifying judgment is predicted to be removed from them. And verse 23, it says, but when he sees his children, uh, like Jacob's children, it describes them as the work of God's hands. That is a, a term of sovereign grace in the lives of the, these, these Jewish people, these descendants of Jacob. Uh, sovereign grace, it says, they will sanctify my name. And to be more specific, it says, they indeed will sanctify, guess who? The Holy One of Jacob. And so they will also come to the nation, also comes to a knowledge of, of Jesus Christ. That's the prediction, the Gentiles and now, after them, the Jewish people would be, would be returned to this one great body of believers. And then it adds this detail, and they will stand in awe of the God of Israel. That's the great hope for the national people of Israel. And so as I've been, uh, I've been wanting to tell you this for a couple of sermons now, and I'll, I'll give you this little detail um, because if you remember, just as Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, and the, you remember the angel of the Lord came down, that was pre-incarnate Christ. That was Jesus came and destroyed 185,000 Assyrians that surrounded Jerusalem. And so just as that happened, and you can imagine, imagine being there as Hezekiah went in the temple, hopeless, prayed, the angel of the Lord destroyed them in a single night, you would stand in awe of the God of Israel, right? Just as that picture was given to us in the Old Testament. In the same way, Jesus tells us of another event associated with the second coming. And so in Luke 21, verse 20, Jesus, this is in the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus is saying, well, you know, what are the signs of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus is speaking in that context, and he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Does that sound familiar? It's a similar picture, isn't it? When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and Zechariah, the prophet, is at the end of the Old Testament. He lived, he's called a post-exilic prophet, meaning after they go to Babylon, then they come back after the exile. So he's living and prophesying way after the events of Hezekiah. So it has nothing to do with that, is my point. Zechariah in 14 verse 2 It says this, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Amazing picture. And so then the Lord will go forth and fight. Same thing happens again against those nations as when he fights in a day of battle. And it says, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Isn't that an amazing picture? And so because of what's happened in the days of Hezekiah, we can know something of what that day will be like in the future. Zechariah 12 verse 6 just blew my mind. It says, 
another little detail of that event. It says, In that day I will make the clans of Judah, that's Jerusalem, like a fire pot among pieces of wood. Isn't that cool? And so just as Isaiah said at the beginning of this passage, she will be like an Ariel to me. She will be like that burning altar and all the nations will just be sacrificed as they attack Jerusalem. Uh, that, that comes to pass. And, and I think the idea is that when that happens, they will stand in awe of the God of Israel. That is just the most incredible event. I think the Bible speaks of that time when the Lord comes and the blood will be up to the horse's bridle when the Lord returns and destroys those that would come against her. But it's coupled with them coming to faith. They're no longer relying on their security system and their iron dome. They're trusting in the Lord when that, when that takes place. Uh, verse 24 puts an exclamation mark on this future salvation by saying, those who err in mind, those who were spiritually blind, In the 29th chapter, those people will know the truth. And those who criticize, which was uh, those in the 28th, I think, you know, they criticize Isaiah's teaching. It says those people will accept instruction. And it just underlines the salvation of the very people that rejected uh, Christ. And so if you can give me one or two more minutes, we'll finish up. But how do we understand what God is doing with Israel And it was a a prominent covenant theologian, you might laugh at me, who helped me understand this passage, but he he believes what we do, and he just says it so well. So Herman Witsius said really succinctly, he said, the offer of grace was first made to the Israelites. When they refused it, it was sent to the Gentiles. But when the fullness of them shall be brought in, it will be again given to the Israelites. That's that's what God's doing with Israel. Uh, And so there's another wise man Uh, Some would think of him as a prophet. His name's Dave Whitfield. But he told me of, he's not really a prophet, but he's a good man. He he told me that in the Hawke's Bay somewhere, there's a river that he can show me. And and that river goes underground and apparently it fills the aquifer. I've never been there, but he, he tells me about this. And Thomas Boston, he has that kind of image in his head. And he says, the covenant made with their fathers, particularly with Abraham. So the Abrahamic covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, he says that secures the conversion of that people. It is with that covenant in respect of them, as with some rivers of which it is observed that they run a good way above the ground and then they're swallowed up uh, in the earth and so run many miles underground, but at length break out again and run above ground until they come to the sea. He says, so that covenant runs visibly till the days of the apostles, But now its visible efficacy is interrupted. So it's like you can't see God dealing with Israel. It doesn't look like that at the moment. But it will break forth again in their conversion, never to be rejected more. And that is what God is doing with the nation of Israel. And so we've identified and unfolded this mysterious way in which God would deal with them. But I mentioned as well that that God often deals with us in the same way. And so if you think about your life, perhaps before you came to faith in Christ, they're they're described here as being proud. They thought little of God. They scoffed and rejected Isaiah's teaching. They refused to trust in the Lord as the cornerstone of their life. They only gave lip service to God. Their hearts weren't really in it. Uh, And because of this, they were judicially hardened. They became spiritually blind. And God's heavy hand, that plowing punishment... Uh, fell upon them and he brought them really low. Some of us know what that feels like. He brings them really low. And so they were, uh, but when they, they, before they came to Christ, I think God acts that same way towards us so often. We see that paddle, uh, pattern, paddle, <laughs> pattern. Uh, A.W. Tozer, here's this saying, perhaps you've heard this. He says, It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And I think that's the truth here, uh, that in the midst of our tribulation, when God brings us low, he finally breaks us. We're humbled to the dust. And I think licking our wounds, we whisper a prayer of genuine repentance from a posture of genuine humility, and everything turns around. There's a reversal in the other sense as well. When we come to faith in Christ, everything turns around. 
Our, our shame and terror are taken away. We come to the knowledge of God in that specific sense of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I think all of us here, as that happened, we stood in awe of God. And I've taken too much time, and we're going to bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these two chapters. Lord, we thank you for the truth. We pray that you'd bless it in proportion to the accuracy in which it was taught. And Lord, we just pray for any here today that would be facing your heavy hand of providence, that they would be humbled to the dust, that they would quietly whisper a prayer and that you would turn around their fortunes. Lord, we we pray you'd help us even as we remember what you've done in our own lives, that it would give us uh, the energy to live another week. And we trust this in Christ's name. Amen.